Okay. Hi, I'm Jonah. Uh, I think this is my third time speaking at, at, one, at one of these meetups, at least. Uh, thank you for having me back. Um, so I, my primary job is to work on STAN or STAN-related stuff um, at Columbia University. Um, for, I assume most people here have heard of STAN if you came to hear me talk, but for anyone who hasn't, it's uh, a programming language and set of algorithms for writing statistical models, primarily Bayesian models, although not necessarily. Um, but uh, until, I don't know, a couple years ago, to work with Stan, you really had to learn, um, and we still prefer that you do, but you really had to learn the Stan language um, and uh, really um, and it, it's been a barrier to entry, I think, for a lot of people. There's a lot of programming languages out there. People get familiar with R or Python, and then you have other things taking up your time. And so learning a new language, and especially one that's related to subtleties and statistical modeling, can be challenging. So we've tried to uh, start developing packages, and we've been going for a couple years now on these for R and hopefully Python uh, at some point. Uh, there's some other people working on that. Um, hopefully a Julia at some point. But right now in R for fitting models using Stan at the back, as the back end, but letting you use familiar native like R modeling syntax uh, to fit those models. And there's a, a couple different ways to do that that I'll mention today, but more like beyond that, even if you're working with Stan yourself and not using one of these packages, if you're using um, RStan, so you write a Stan program and then yourself and then fit the model and get results in R. Uh, we're also working on, on tools to basically give you recommendations and uh, routines that we find work really well in a Bayesian, applied Bayesian workflow. Um, and uh, this is, I sh I'll mention at certain points uh, in this uh, talk, but this is work that's being done by a lot of people, not just me. I see a few in the room right now who I'll mention at some point when I get to their <laughs> stuff. Um, but there's like a whole large team at Columbia working on this, and then people from all around the world are contributing also. And so if you're someone who's interested in Bayesian modeling and you know R, uh, and you want to contribute, definitely let us know. Um, that would be great. Uh, okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is actually not talk about R. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you what's going on outside of R briefly, um, because actually then I'll relate it back to R. Uh, there's a lot of work being done uh, in Julia, both by Brian, who you heard talk uh, about the job a second ago, and uh, Rob Goodman. Um, we are uh, Mitzi, who's here, is working on some new stuff for Python, more lightweight interfaces for Python. There's a new HTTP interface to Stan. Uh, I'll share these slides afterwards. These, some of these are like hyperlinked to the actual uh, sites. Um, there's an HTTP interface to Stan, which is developed by Alan Riddell. Um, there's uh, some stuff that's similar to things that we've been doing in R with the Bayes plot package that are available in a new Python library called RVs. Um, that has been done by some people that we collaborate with and some others. And then finally, I guess the last one does touch on R. But we want to make the interfaces to stand more similar to each other, to have less uh, differences in user experiences if you're using stand from R or Python or Julia or something like that. So this is stuff that's mostly going on outside of R. And of course, this doesn't cover the actual development going on in terms of new stuff in the Stan language. There's a new compiler being written and all that stuff. These are more like interface things that are, that are happening. Um, but uh, so, so there is stuff going on outside of R, but by far the most work that's been done has been in R. And that's partially just because uh, some of us who have been really involved with Stan are also R users, and so we've you know, first started implementing stuff in R, and we've slowly gotten more people involved from other, uh, other languages like Python and Julia. Um, and so, oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I don't think I, maybe, maybe I should not do it full screen here. Well, that's not gonna work either. Okay, so you're gonna have to pardon the, um, <laughs> the line that's in the middle of this slide. I'll explain it in a second. This is a not entirely coherent 
partial map of what I'm calling the Stan ecosystem in R. And then there's, there's uh, extensions to this, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, this is contained to just stuff that's being done by the Stan development team. But um, there are a lot of other people contributing too, and there's other packages that I'll mention also. Um, but basically, what happens is this. We, this arrow, this uh, big arrow up here, if you can kind of see, is like Stan, <laughs> right? The C++ code, uh, everything that goes on there. And we have this package called Stan headers, which you basically never need to interact with yourself. Uh, but, it, but it's like the foundation of our Stan and all these other packages, which basically contains the Stan C++ uh, headers. Um, and so then there's R Stan, which is the main R interface to Stan. So if you write your own Stan program right, uh, in the Stan language, you can fit it from an R session using R Stan and with your data in as R, various types of R objects. Um, However, to use RSTAN, you need to know how to write in the STAN language, um, which is great, but uh, there's definitely, uh, I mean, there are whole, there's a whole, Ben Goodrich, one of the other STAN developers, teaches a whole semester course at Columbia and on Bayesian statistics and STAN. You can only really get into like learning the STAN language towards the end of that class, and even then you don't become an expert. It's a, it's a, lot, of, it's a lot of work to learn a new programming language, to learn in R. And so this next level of tools is hopefully a way for people to start using these tools before you're necessarily an expert at this level. Um, R Stan ARM and BRMS are two R packages that have Stan programs that, well, in R Stan ARM's case, are already written and pre-compiled, and in BRMS's case, get written for you as you uh, interact with the package. Um, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to show an example using our Stan ARM today. I'll talk a little bit about the differences between the two. Um, but the main difference is that our Stan ARM, you don't have to deal with C++ compilers at all. Uh, co the models come out of the box pre-compiled, and a lot of the headache for new users of Stan and experienced users of Stan is uh, dealing with the C++ tool chains and stuff like that. So our Stan ARM gets around that entirely. Models are pre-compiled ahead of time. BRMS uh, writes models on the fly for you, which lets it fit a wider range of models than our Stan ARM, but you have to deal with the C++ tool chain. Um, anyway, uh, so these are packages, uh, and we'll see it, where you specify our regular R modeling syntax, like you would with like the GLM function or something like that. Um, and it'll get, uh, the model will get fit in Stan, and you will get uh, posterior distributions instead of point estimates or whatever some of these other packages are giving you. Um, and so you might see this RStan tools package, which I'll, actually let me hold off on that one. Uh, this next row here are what I'm calling like post-processing tools, um, although that's pretty vague. Uh, they're all quite different. So this says shiny Stan. I'm sorry about the paneling here. This says shiny Stan, which is, um, a Shiny app, basically. So uh, if people, I don't know if people are familiar with RStudio Shiny uh, web framework, uh, which is really cool. And it's a Shiny app that essentially takes a fitted model, either from RStan or one of these packages, um, and brings up a bunch, like a GUI, a graphical user interface, where you can look at plots and diagnostics and summary statistics. Um, Bayes plot here is. Uh, somewhat like a static version of Shiny Stan. It's, it's, it creates ggplot objects for you, but, um, and none of the coding necessarily behind Bayes plot is revolutionary at all, but it is basically there with a, a full like library of functions that we think are useful at different stages of the analysis. So you don't have to write your own code uh, to check important diagnostics, to look at uh, let dis, uh, posterior distributions for certain types of parameters. If you want to um, do more customized stuff, I'll talk in a minute about uh, some packages that other people have contributed that will do that. Um, here this says Lou, <laughs> like uh, toilet in <laughs> the UK. <laughs> uh, and that stands for leave one out, uh, which is a package for doing uh, basically efficient approximations to leave one out cross-validation for like full Bayesian models, right? So not dealing with point estimates. Um, and so Lou is used to 
So you fit a model with RSTAN, you fit a model with one of these uh, higher level interfaces, um, and you want to compare it to another model or several other models on estimated out of sample predictive performance. So you can use the loo package for that. And it's designed to work with like posterior distributes, right? So not models that just return point estimates, but that return, you know, some large number of samples from a distribution. Um, and then this projpred package, uh, again, sorry, it looks like it's crossed out. Uh, it stands for project, projection predictive variable selection, or maybe it's <laughs> around, which is uh, a package that does a variable selection, um, which has been developed by um, some of our colleagues in Finland. Uh, and so if you fit a model with a lot of covariates and you're interested in like, you know, can I find a smaller subset of these uh, that are sufficient to attain the same predictive accuracy or, or something like that. Uh, you can use the projpred package. And again, all these packages are designed to link up with each other and uh, accept the output from one package into another or some small transformation of that output into the next layer. And I'll show examples of this um, in a moment. These arrows loosely tell you which of these packages kind of work with the others. So. For example, if you do cross-validation in Lou, then the base plot package has some nice diagnostic plots for that. Uh, the projpred package relies on some of the internals in the Lou package to do uh, some of the calculations for the variable selection. So these are all kind of tied together here. Um, just stop. By the way, feel free to interrupt me uh, with questions at any moment uh, if you have that. Just a curiosity, have people used these packages at all, RSTAN, ARM, and BRMS? A couple? OK, cool. So that really is new information for a lot of people. OK, so I'm going to show you these in a second. Um, before I do, so this is, this, these are the packages that our developers that are part of the STAN development team are working on. And we started working on this other package called RSTAN Tools, which basically tries to take stuff in R that's being done by both of these packages and avoid code duplication, basically, like, and avoid conflicts in naming of methods, right? So it has a bunch of generic functions, and then these packages define methods for them. Um, but it also allows us to provide like a template, essentially, for how do you create your own R package that fits STAN models, right? Uh, and we have a new release of R STAN tools coming out soon that's going to make this process even easier. Um, but basically what it'll do is it'll set up the package directory structure for you so that you can have pre-compiled models, right? So you could write your own STAN program, write some interface from R, some function like GLM or whatever that takes the model specification, and then fit it in STAN and return whatever you want to your users. And so uh, actually, I realize now that this, the rethinking package is one of these that doesn't use <laughs> R stand tools, but there's a lot of them. You can, you can see them on CRAN. But there's, so there's a lot of other R packages that are uh, coming out now that either explicitly tell you, or if you look into it, you'll find that in the, as the back end, they're fitting models in STAN. If you look at the R stand package, pay, again, actually all of these are hyperlinked too, so I'll share these slides. E you can click on each of these names, and I'll take you to a web page for each of the packages. Um, but, uh, so what was I saying? Uh, yeah, if you look at the CRAN page for RSTAN, you'll see all the packages that depend on it now. And most of them are like now model fitting packages, like particular models that instead of everybody who wants to fit that model has to rewrite it themselves, somebody puts together the STAN program for that and then allows you to input your data from R and can release it as an R package. Um, and then finally, uh, there's a, a relatively new package called TidyBase, which is very cool, which if, for example, you want to make more intricate, customizable plots or something than the ones that Bayes plot gives you, you can use TidyBase to uh, basically manipulate data. But in this case, the data are like posterior draws um, and put them in nice data frames for ggplot and other things in the tidyverse. Um, and so TidyBase and some of these other packages, which I'll uh, mention, are not being developed by the STAN development team, but play really nicely with uh, the STAN ecosystem. 
and we think they're really cool tools. Um, but if, uh, let me show you uh, for a second. I'm just gonna click on here. Oops. So this is what you'd get if you, um, oh, sorry, I meant to show you the, this R stamp page, right? So this is the, I'm sure many of you have seen these web pages before, the CRAN project page for RSTAN. And all of these packages here, uh, most of them now are fitting models. And not all of them, but most of them are fitting models. Doesn't matter if, it's, if the Markov chains have converged, but, um, uh, but yeah, so the rows here are like draws and the columns are like observations, right? And so this plot is summarizing this. The thick curve is like a kernel density estimate of the observed data. And each of these thin blue thin curves is a kernel density, kernel density estimate of one of the rows of this uh, matrix here, right? And so what is this saying? This is uh, <laughs> saying, well, how well, what's the uncertainty and how well do our predictions for this data match the observed data? Of course, if we match it in every tiny little facet and all the noise, capturing the noise, we might overfit, but we certainly want to be plausibly fitting the data, right? And so this doesn't tell you necessarily, so th and, and also this is looking at the whole distribution of the outcome, like the marginal distribution of, of the outcome. We can also make these plots like by group, by, uh, we can compute summaries. I'm gonna show you an example of that in a second. Uh, anyway, this is, this is the call to make this plot from our stand arm. And basically under the hood, this is what it's doing in the Bayes plot package. Uh, <laughs> so this, this PP check function uh, calls posterior predict and then passes it to the appropriate function. This is from uh, Bayes plot here. And there's like tons of these functions for all sorts of different scenarios that you might find yourself in. Um, right, and uh, so another example this top line here uh, is again equivalent to this in Bayes plot here. What this does is might look a little smushed here, right? I'm making. Let me put a label on the x-axis to make. Uh, oops, y is valence. Uh, so this is actually a plot with the x variable on the x-axis, so arousal uh, on the x-axis and the outcome on the y-axis, and these are 90%, so the 50% and 90% predictive intervals, right? And then these are the observed data points. Eyeballing it right now, it roughly looks like maybe 10% are outside the 90% interval, which is good, but... <laughs> Uh, we could calculate that exactly. But so we have an interval here for each of the observed data points. Again, we could make these for like out of sample predictions too. But um, so this is comparing each observed data point to uh, the predictive distribution for that data point. In other words, to a column of that previous matrix, if that makes sense. Um, and again, we can make the same plot uh, directly using the functions in the base plot package, which means that even if you're not using STAN, if you're doing any other sort of uh, MCMC or Bayesian simulations, you can also use the base plot package. There are some other packages writing their own samplers that are still using base plot. Um, it doesn't need to know about uh, STAN. Um, right, and so there's a lot more different plots in this package, and each one of them can be made using some function in RSTAN ARM, same thing for the BRMS package and others that will call those functions for you uh, and prepare the, the data for them. Um, I'm gonna skip this plot here. So, get a little more interesting, 
right? Are, are people familiar with the LMER, the Elmer function? Uh, some people I did some consulting with once called it lemur, which I thought was nice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? And so here we can just fit the same model, but now we'll allow for different intercepts and slopes by this is the like participant ID uh, variable. So it's, I don't know, it's some coding for uh, which the uh, participant it is. Um, and so if we fit that model, we get some output that looks somewhat like the output from the LME4 package like down here, right, where to be totally honest, like this doesn't really make much sense from a Bayesian perspective that these aren't actually error terms. These are error terms in, a fre in frequentist statistics. They're not in Bayesian, but the output we have kind of matches what the LME4 package is doing um, just so that it's easy to transition, right? So you get a summary of like the standard deviation of the uh, group level coefficients and the correlation between the slopes and the intercept. Um, but unlike the LME4 package, right, we have, so we have full posterior distributions for every one of the unknown quantities, including the covariance matrix uh, but, uh, of the so-called random effects, although <laughs> I don't really like that term. Um, right, and so, for example, let's look, uh, we can make other types of plots now because we have like grouping by participant. So here's, and again, all of these things are kind of automated for you by using these functions from our stan arm that make the uh, that call this Bayes plot package for you. So what's the, this is a his, one histogram per. Uh, sorry, that's this line. Of, you can't really see them both at the same time. This is one histogram per participant, where uh, the vertical line is like the median uh, prediction for. No, sorry, the median observed value for that participant. There were multiple. Uh, observations per participant. And then this is the, pr the distribution, the predicted distribution of that median, right? So now we're talking about distributions of statistics here, not just distributions of predictions, right? So in other words, that matrix that had like one column per data point and one row per simulation, right? I can now take, you know, find all the columns corresponding to participant five, right? All the predicted data points for participant five, and I can compute the median of those, except I'm computing that for like 100 or thousands of rows, and so I'm gonna get a distribution. So this is telling me what's my uncertainty in predicting like the median here, right? Uh, or whatever, you can, so what's nice about this is it just accepts a, either a string or an actual function definition here. Uh, so anything that takes a vector and returns a scalar, you can pass into here. And so there'll be different functions that are appropriate to check for different models. If you were fitting some like zero inflated model, you might want to check the predict, the, the statistic might be a function that calculates the proportion of zeros in the data, right? And then you'd get, you know, a plot like this that's saying, well, what's the predicted proportion of zeros for like this participant or something like that? And does the model do a reasonable job capturing what was actually observed for them? Does that make sense? And so again, there's a way to do that directly in Bayes plot here. And like I was saying, this, this, could, have, this could have been uh, this, just to demonstrate that this could, <laughs> you know, this could get more complicated in here. It just needs to return a, a scalar. And so it can be whatever is like useful in your analysis. Um, and so really the point here is not that you should make these exact plots that I'm making, but that there are tools to allow you to make the ones that are appropriate for what you're studying. So like this plot, checking the median by participant might not make any sense for what you're doing, but you can check other things. The idea is to be checking visualizations like this, which I find are much easier to interpret than like a numerical summary of this. I'm not sure if there would be like a non-painful way to 
sit and look at the numbers underlying this plot. Um, right, and so, let's see. Are there, uh, how long do I have, Jared? Okay. Uh, I wanted to show one last thing. So one really nice thing, oh, here, I'm gonna skip this, but it's compatible with the broom package for like tidy summaries and stuff like that. Um, but a nice thing about getting a, a, a posterior distribution, right, instead of just a point estimate here, is we can do something like this. So what is this plot? So again, these are all the participants. The gray points are like the actual data. So it's basically the same plot that I showed all the way at the beginning where like here's the data, right? And then we have uh, this uh, dashed line is like the popula like the estimated like posterior mean regression line, right? Like just as in not participant specific, uh, just the, the like global regression line, right? And then these blue, uh, the dark blue line are the mean, the posterior mean regression line for each participant. In other words, each participant's gonna have like a different slope, a different intercept, right? And we're gonna have lots of draws of those so we can find the mean, line, the mean regression line for each of the participants. But we can also visual, we can also plot, so these thin lines are just other regression lines plotted using some of the posterior draws, uh, and it's, we can just essentially overplot these lines and get a sense for the uncertainty we have. We could make some sort of like ribbon plot or something like that, but I really like doing it this way. because so, e so each one of these is actually a regression line that is from the posterior distribution of the model that is consistent, at least to some extent, with the data, right? I could just plot a point prediction through that line, but here we actually get to see, this is like, I don't know, 100 different regression lines for each person, but I could get however many posterior samples I tell Stan to give me. Yep. Just like a more like general kind of Bayesian question. So yeah. like this like global like Bayesian regression line. Yeah. You know, your prior here was not really domain specific, right? Uh, My prior here was, I don't even know. I would think about it in general. <laughs> I would think about it harder in general, so yeah. I know with like Bayesian, the like yeah. analytics on the Mm -hmm. um, compared to like a frequentist approach, sure, like, yeah. would you say what, what really happened here? Is it just like some shrinkage essentially uh, like, uh, as a bunch of a prior or is, is the simple regression fit really better in this case or is it just like a uh, you know, what the, the difference that you'd find in any given example could be big, could be small. Basically in terms of the difference between like what our Stan arm is doing and what like the LME4 package is doing, which I think they're doing like maximum marginal likelihood or something like that, um, is uh, a little bit, I can, let me point you to a resource instead of hanging out by the time. So if you, you can link to, uh, on the our Stan arm webpage uh, in the vignettes, so I'll put this link in the thing, but I'll show you that one of them is about these, uh, there's a section on like a comparison with the LME4 package. Um, and it talks about uh, essentially that you're gonna get, doing it the non-Bayesian way, you're gonna get under estimates of like the hierarchical variance components basically, is that you're gonna underestimate your uncertainty. Uh, how much that matters to you is, <laughs> kind of specific to there, um, but I'll put that link there. But it's a good question. I think one of the, the main benefits, I would say, is actually going, what you could do going further than this, which is getting the predictive distributions for the observables, right? Like in some sense, who cares about the parameters? They're just, they're not real. We just made them up, <laughs> right? They're there to hopefully capture some useful structure of the problem, but eventually we want to translate them into some statement about the world or about the thing that we care of. And to do that, we make predictions for the outcome variable. And so the real power of the Bayesian approach there is that you, you get a full posterior predictive distribution and then you can do all this nice coherent decision theory and, um, and all of that. 
But um, there are benefits in the estimation too. The, the disadvantage is this is slower than running LME4. Uh, <laughs> so I would say we're giving you a better, a more full answer, but you're sacrificing some speed, certainly. That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, a different, so what I thought you were going to say, which maybe you also mean, is that you can get, like for example, uh, er, you can get an LME4 when it does this uh, print output, you can get like one or minus one here or like zero here, for example, uh, which we can avoid in this context because the priors help with that. So you get like pathological situations that don't work uh, from the maximum marginal likelihood perspective, but do in the Bayesian perspective. If you just mean that you get like one of the, part, you mean like one of the parameters for the participants or something? Yeah, one participant has a negative slope, whereas all the rest are Yeah, so in theory, you, sh you should be able to, if you had some prior information to suggest that, then you could encode that and that would help in that situation. If you have no reason ahead of time to think that that's true, it's questionable whether or not you should put that in the model. But if you do, right, if you don't believe the result that you're getting, it probably means you had some information that wasn't being included in the model, right? And so in that case, yeah, it probably makes sense that you do have some prior information that wasn't put in the model that if you did would be closer to what you were thinking. So yeah. I think, does that make sense? It's okay if it does. <laughs> okay. I can, you talk to me after and I'll try to give a, a better answer. <laughs> Another question? Are you, raise your, are you raising your hand? Sorry. Um, I, I yeah. I was going to ask the, the plot that you showed before, if you have the, the dash line and the solid line, then every plot. Right, so you said the dash line the dashed line should be the same in each of the plots. Right. So that's the population line and the solid line is, is the subject specific. Correct. Uh, I don't know if it's just my eyes playing tricks on me, but it seems like I think most that's what of the is. solid lines are attenuated compared to the dashed line. Most of the solid lines. Right. Uh, the slopes are not as steep. Not as steep. Yeah. That is. Yes, in not all, yeah, I could see that. Uh, so that's possible in this, it's really gonna depend on the example. It's possible that there's a lot of uh, pooling being done in this example. Uh, I'm not sure, but that is one thing to, to look at in a picture like this, right? Is like what is tending to happen to, how are these other lines getting pulled? So there's a plot in the paper. Um, I think it's in the paper that uh, also plots on here. Uh, it essentially, it shows you what, you, shows you another line here that's like a, a, a degree of pooling that's going on. I'm not sure if we put that in the paper or not. But yes, I think, you, I see what you mean here. The dash lines look pretty steep. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think you're right. It's probably it's something going on with the data, with the priors, with the. I'm not sure that these. The priors were very straight. They seem to have a negative value. The priors had negative values for the parameters, but not for the uh, outcome. Yes. Yeah. That. that yes. Uh, that's a good point. Yes. Uh, well, that's certainly what's encoded by, yeah, so there's, right, so there's, um, there's a global intercept term here also that's shifting everything by a certain amount, if that's what you're saying. Uh, but, um, yeah, the degree to which the slope differs between the population estimate and the individual participants is going to be sensitive to the particular data set, to the strength of the priors, uh, to things like that, which we didn't like go super into detail about what we were using in this example. But if we did, yeah, I would say we could investigate 
what impact different prior distributions would have on the amount of shrinkage that's going on here, the amount of pulling the slopes a different direction from the population slope. Um, you could look at, let's say you could take this data set and try to add information to it, like make the, the noise lower and see if that changes it. Or if you added more noise to the raw data, then uh, right there'd be less in unique information pulling it in different directions for the individual participants. So there's like a lot of stuff that's going to depend on this individual data set. Um, but yeah, most, the idea mostly is like in some cases it, it won't matter, like all the participants might look pretty similar and in other cases the data will suggest that they look really different, but we probably want to know that, right? Um, which is why I tend to, and this is something that uh, Richard McElwraith also says who wrote the really good statistical rethinking book, is that I tend to think by default about fitting models like this and then finding out that there's not much variation across participant than assuming there isn't ahead of time and starting with like a regular GLM. So kind of the, you know, I realized that I fit a GLM and then a GLM with uh, uh, these group level parameters second, but in some sense it kind of makes sense to just start with this model because it seems like a more reasonable assumption that there is going to be variation than there isn't. But, uh, but an advantage to fitting the simpler model first is that you can always check like, okay, what am I learning by adding this component into the model by adding these? So one thing I don't have, I'm not gonna have the time to do here, but we could look now um, and in the code that I'll share, the last section is going over the Lou package that I mentioned we could look, I'll run it quickly, but we can look at which model is like expected to have better out of sample predictive performance, right? Um, and in this case, it is the multi-level model, which is some, and again, I don't have that much time to go into this, but it's in the code and I'm gonna link to the vignettes on it, but you know, we wanna ask the question, was it worth it to add all this extra structure to the model, right? And in this case, the structure is not incredibly complicated, but you can imagine that we did some other, we could have a lot more varying parameters. We could have a nonlinear model. We could have, we could add also, we could add time varying effects. We could have smooth terms or whatever. We could add a lot of complicated structure to the model. And then you want some way of saying, was it worth it to add all this structure? And so one way to say that is, well, do I improve the expected predictive performance of my model? And that's what the Lou package is designed for um, and so I'll share this code here and you can see it's quite simple to use it. You just put the line Lou here, but it'll give you essentially diff estimates of like the difference in future predictive performance for these models. Now that assumes that the underlying data generating process is not going to like suddenly change when you go into the future. Um, but uh, so that's what the next step might be to say, was it worth adding this next level of structure to the model, right? If this model had a ton of predictors, the next step may be like, can we use the proj pred package to find a subset that does a, almost each? They're for all sorts of different purposes. I couldn't, I'm not even familiar with most of them. And in fact, Noam, who's here, and I were having a conversation the other day about how it would be nice to have uh, a little more uh, suggestions and recommendations for good unit testing procedures for packages based off of Stan. Um, and so there's this growing kind of extension of the ecosystem that is uh, where just any user can now develop a Stan package that is based, uh, or an R package that's based on Stan. Um, and again, you can use the R Stan tools package. Oops. You could get here by clicking on R Stan tools in my slide or the Stan website slash name of R package will bring you right to the website for any of the R packages. But if you do want to create your own packages interfacing with Stan, we have uh, kind of a vignette here that'll go through how do you use our Stan tools to set up that package and put your Stan program in there and get it all to work nicely and pre-compile so that when somebody wants to run a model, they don't have to wait for the Stan program to, to compile. Um, but again, we're actually going to have our stand tools 2.0 soon. That'll slightly change some of these things, but we think 
it'll make it even easier. Um, OK, so what does it mean to have an R package that's based on STAN with pre-compiled models? So the primary example of that is our STAN arm, which <laughs> stands ARM is applied regression modeling. Um, and so again, I encourage you, I'm going to use some of these websites uh, as part of this talk because we're trying to actually make these useful. This was built with package down, so thank you, uh, Hadley or somebody. <laughs> UA, yeah. Uh, but um, so what does it look like to, uh, I don't know, fit a model with the RSTAN ARM package? Uh, it looks a lot like, I'm going to show you another example here, but it looks, all right, that's like the same formula that you could put to the GLM function with a binomial link, right? Except these things are different, right? But otherwise, if you've ever used the regular GLM function, you could put for a binomial regression, right, a formula like that, a data frame. Everything's exactly the same as it would be if you use GLM. Uh, there are just these optional lines here that uh, we may talk about, but they're actually optional. We have some default settings for that where you can specify prior distributions, right? Um, but the point of the package, in particular our stan arm, is to make transitioning from using the standard R modeling tools to getting posterior distributions for those same models as easy as possible, basically, right? Um, so you don't need to learn any new syntax. You might need to learn new concepts if you're trying to get into Bayesian statistics, right? The role of prior distributions, how do we work with posterior distributions and posterior predictive distributions, but you don't need to learn any new syntax, at least to fit the same models that you're already fitting with GLM, but also with the, the mixed effects models, the GLMER models, and all sorts of other, um, of other ones. And in fact, these are the list of <laughs> modeling functions in our stan arm at the moment. I don't know if you can see, but basically for a lot of different standard ones, so there's a beta reg function in R for the beta regression, and you can just put a stan prefix in front of it. For, well, for the, this is, this happens to, there's a big LM function in R, which is like a memory efficient uh, linear model function. You can put a stan in front of it. Uh, I don't know if there's a cloged function in R, but anyway, <laughs> you can do that. There's the GAM4 package, which fits like smooth uh, generalized additive models. Uh, you can stick a stan, a stan prefix in front of it, right, GLM. These are the ones from the LME4 package, like the linear mixed effects models and generalized linear mixed effects models. Uh, I'm noticing now that I need to update this because we also have the nonlinear models now from the LME4 package, like the Stan, oh no, it's here, sorry, the Stan and Elmer. Um, and then a couple things that uh, I'm not sure have analog, oh, here's polar for ordinal models. And then we have some uh, multivariate generalized linear models and some joint I guess survival models or longitudinal and time to event models, which I'm not sure actually have a, an analog in uh, the standard R package world. I'm not sure about that. But most cases, you take the function that you're already using, put a stan underscore in front, and you're three quarters of the way <laughs> on your way to uh, getting a, an actual, uh, getting a posterior distribution for that. Um, so let me show you what that looks like in action. Uh, I'm grabbing a data set from a paper that I was going to say that I wrote. I really didn't write any of this. Uh, Chelsea, with Chelsea Muth and Zeta Orovex from Penn State, uh, they did almost all of this. And I chimed in and said, oh, that's really good. <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> uh, but um, it's a tutorial. So they're in the psychology department at uh, Penn State, and it's a tutorial on using our Stan Arm and Shiny Stan in psychology. But for now, I'm just grabbing the data set that they use so I can fit a R Stan Arm model. And the variables of interest in that data set 
are, and I guess these are official terms in certain fields of <laughs> psychology, but they're interesting for, to me, uh, valence and arousal. Uh, so those have particular definitions here. So valence is levels of pleasant feelings and arousal is level of activation, uh, whatever that means exactly. But these are self-reported scores, right? Um, but the point here is not to say, is this a good experiment or not, but to show you how would you, what would you do in r stand arm if you wanted to fit a model predicting levels of valence from levels of self-reported levels of arousal, and, and then if you wanted to allow that to vary by participant in the study, right, to make separate estimates for the participant, um, and then how to use some of the other R packages to look at the results. Um, and again, so you can, um, you can take a look at like the full thing that this is from uh, in this paper here that, uh, that's linked to here, and all there's the code and data are here. But um, it's a good example for our stand arm because the models don't take long to fit. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to dive into the dangerous world of live coding here. Um, should I make this bigger? How's that? Can people see? Uh, OK. You don't have to worry about this stuff right here. But basically, it's a bunch of like regular R code that I'm not going to worry about here. This is just a ggplot of the data. Yeah? No? It's either a good or bad advertisement of RStudio today. We're going to find out. <laughs> Hopefully good. I like RStudio. So anyway, this is a, a scatter plot for each of the 20 participants in the study, or a subset of 20, and maybe this is a subset of a larger study, where you have the self-reported arousal levels on scales from one to 100, uh, 0 to 100, and same with the valence on the y-axis here. So these are like raw data points, like self-reported points. Uh, by participant, we can see that uh, it's possible that there's different stuff going on here for sorry for different uh, participants. Um, but we're going to focus on pretty simple models he here just for today. But so if you just wanted to do like the most basic thing and say let's just fit a linear, re a simple linear regression model here, uh, well you could use the LM function in R, or you could just use GLM, which defaults to a uh, family is. Gaussian, uh, which is just a linear regression model. So to fit that in our stand arm, we actually could, I could stop here, and now it's like exactly the same code as uh, GLM, and this will actually run. Uh, but I want to show you some of these extra options here. It's running in parallel here, and for a simple model like this, it takes longer to like spawn the processes than to actually run. The, the models, but um, so you can specify uh, how many cores to use. Uh, I guess it was using one. How many cores to use? So you can run these models in parallel because we're running many Markov chains at the same time to do sampling from the posterior distribution. Um, what I want to show you first is. <laughs> uh, in our stand arm, no. So there's GPU functionality that is coming to stand. Uh, Mitzi, do you remember the latest uh, when that's coming out? I don't know. <laughs> it, it might. It might be already. Uh, right. But not in our stand arm yet, at least. What the G what the GPU will let you do uh, will do like you know like Cholesky factorization of matrices like big things like that and use GPUs for that, uh, but that is not implemented in our stand arm yet. Although I assume we probably will allow for that at some point. But yeah, there's GPU functionality coming to stand right now. What this will do is just send uh, a different Markov chain to each processor or each CP, CPU processor. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to show this one argument here, which doesn't exist in regular GLM and couldn't really exist in regular GLM, which I see now is exactly in the wrong spot on the screen, Okay, which says prior PD equals true. Prior PD here stands for the prior predictive distribution. So this. We have default prior distributions going on on here. I'm not going to get too much into that, because we could spend, I don't know, when I 
do stand classes for Jared. We spend tons of time talking about prior distributions. I don't want to go down, down that role. But there are prior distributions being used here. And you can specify your own, which we recommend doing. Uh, <laughs> if you, uh, and so what, it, what setting this argument will do is it will draw from the prior distribution uh, for you. And then if you make predictions afterwards, that's equivalent to predicting from the prior predictive distribution, as, as in what, is, what am I saying before I learn anything from the data, right? So essentially, what's going to happen here is it's going to like run the model, but it's not going to condition on the valence variable. And the estimates that we get out at the end are going to summarize the prior distribution. And then we could make predictions from the model and look at what, is, what are our priors implying that the distribution for the outcome is, right? Um, and this is a good thing to do before you start fitting models and going down that range because it's a way of saying, are my, am I making assumptions that are consistent with my prior knowledge about the situation, right? And sometimes it's hard to know that by saying, what's my prior distribution? In this case, it's relatively easy because we have like one predictor here and it's a linear model. But in other cases, like thinking about what the prior distribution on one particular coefficient in a big complicated model, um, isn't necessarily going to tell you if the data generating process that's implied by these choices of priors is realistic for the outcome variable of interest, right? And to do that, you need to, just the same way that after we fit a model, we can make predictions which are basically summarizing what the model's saying about the outcome variable after we learn from the data. We can do it ahead of time and saying, what are our assumptions basically ahead of time? And are they reasonable given what we already know? Uh, and so to do that, so if I did that, and then I plotted, um, and then I plot them, let's make a histogram instead. Uh, so our stan arm has this plot method that is using the Bayes plot package that I mentioned behind the scenes. You can directly get the output yourself and use the Bayes plot package yourself, and there's some code later in this file that does that. But the R stan arm plot method, and this is the same with a bunch of other R packages that depend on stan, have methods that they're, it, it's doing the work for you and, make it, and then calling that Bayes plot package. But you can go in yourself and use uh, Bayes plot also. And so, these may or may not be reasonable at all priors, and that's not really what I'm trying to think about right now, but these are the implied uh, default priors that are going on in this particular case. Um, so this is an example of you can look at what assumptions you're making ahead of time oops, by specifying this um, prior PD argument instead of just starting to fit models without saying, what am I actually what assumptions am I making? Well, the assumptions that I'm making are these are reasonable prior values for these parameters, and also that if I made predictions based on this, that it would be a reasonable summary of my current state of knowledge about the outcome before using this new data that I have about it. All right. um, okay. There's a, if you look more at the base plot package, there's um, some links to a paper that the package is related to that goes into a lot more of this, and I'll, I'll add the, the link too. But then, so then if we actually fit the model here with prior P, without the prior PD argument, then we can look, right, does this make sense? And this is uh, somewhat similar to regular output uh, from R, but a little bit different. Up at the top, we get some Summary info information, uh, the number of predictors is two because technically there's an intercept also and that's being counted. Um, and then we report these weird, um, <laughs> weird summary statistics here, right? So, well, first of all, there's no P values, there's no T statistics or Z statistics or whatever they're using. Um, and, but there's not even means or standard deviations. So by default, what we've chosen to report here are posterior medians and a, a version of the standard deviation based on the median absolute deviation. And basically, the reason is, is that these are more robust to distribute posterior distributions with, for example, fat tails or other things. Or for, God forbid you had a Cauchy-like distribution that didn't even have a mean or something like that. In other words, it's always valid to report these uh, 
regardless about what's going on with like higher moments of the, the posterior distribution. But, uh, so by default, we're reporting things that are always valid to report, but you can get all the, oops, but the summary function will go into a lot more detail uh, here and actually give you posterior means, standard deviations, quantiles, uh, MCMC diagnostics, all that stuff, um, all that stuff here. Uh, and so the nice thing though is that because we're in R, this, uh, yeah, so this uh, fitted model object, which we call a stand reg object, has all these methods associated with it. And so all the standard ones like COEF and all these other things are gonna work for this. Um, they're gonna give you some, they're gonna give you, um, they're gonna give you point estimates that are based on these posterior distributions, but they'll work. But we recommend actually going and using these full posterior distributions. So if I, I could plot, uh, we'll look at the posterior distributions of the coefficients. So these are now the posterior distributions for the intercept for the coefficient on the arousal variable and for the residual uh, standard deviation. Um, and the idea here is that, yeah, you could pick the mean or the median or some point estimate and plug it into whatever you're doing next, but ideally you'll actually take this full distribution which summarizes your uncertainty and do whatever you're doing next for each value <laughs> in this distribution and propagate that uncertainty forward. So if you wanted to compute uh, some, uh, let's see, like uh, if you wanted to make a prediction, then instead of plugging in like summaries of these distributions and using those to make the predictions, you'd actually make a prediction for each value uh, of the posterior distribution and then you get a whole distribution of the predictions, right? Instead of a point prediction and a standard error or something like that. Um, for example, uh, Here, uh, let's do this. So this function in our stand arm, which is called PP check for posterior predictive check is another function that's calling this Bayes plot package under the hood. Um, so you can call Bayes plot yourself and do a little processing, but our stand arm will figure out, okay, what does it need to do with this particular model object to make the right plot? And so what this is doing is it's taking, it's making a hundred predictions. These are in sample predictions. We could plot out of sample predictions also, but then I'd need to pass like a new data frame uh, for those. Uh, but it's, it's making a hundred predictions, right? But it's making a hundred predictions of the full data set. Why? So the size of this data set is uh, 272 observations. So it's making, it's predicting 272 observations 100 times. <laughs> Does that make sense? I have 272 full predicted data sets. But that means that I, uh, sorry, I have 100 full data sets, each of size 200 and whatever. <laughs> uh, actually, in fact, why don't I, is that clear to everyone? No, let me, let me make it even clearer. So what it's doing under the hood is calling this nice function called posterior predict. This is like the predict function in R, except it's always, so here, let's see, I'm gonna call it Y rep. So, unfortunately, this argument name and this argument name are different for weird historical reasons, but, um, okay, so, this line of code here uh, is drawing the data sets that are gonna be used by this function to, to make the plot. So I'm showing you kind of what's going on internally. Uh, so this Y rep object is going to have 200 and whatever columns, the number of data points that I have in my original model and 100 rows. And so I could even, because our studio is cool, I could even click on this. Yeah, so 
the first row here is a prediction for, uh, for each of the 200 and whatever values in the data set using the first sample from the posterior distribution. So like the first saved iteration of the Markov chain, which is going to have a unique value of alpha, beta, and sigma, or, right? And the second row is using the next draw from the posterior distribution, pick, predict a whole data set, right? Um, and so if you looked at the columns, then what they'd be telling you is like for the first data point in the data set that I have, here's a distribution of predictions for it. Now these are in sample, but that posterior predict function accepts a new data argument, just like the predict function in R, so you could get out of sample predictions too. Do you have a yeah, sequential draw, or do you just randomize? Uh, I don't remember. I think these are <laughs> sequential. There's, there was a, uh, <laughs> there's, um, Originally, RSTAN was like permuting yeah. draws for you, but actually, we now think that's a really bad idea. So we're <laughs> going to get rid of that. I think I think these should these the ones that we're doing in RSTAN arm are sequential. It shouldn't matter. Uh, uh, yeah, no, but like the posterior draws, like if you call as extract on a stand fed object, it has this weird permuted argument. Anyway, <laughs> it shouldn't really good job predicting the outcome variable, for example. Um, anyway, uh, I feel like I've talked for a while. Are there other questions? I'm happy to answer other questions about this stuff or Bayesian statistics. Yeah. So this is perhaps very naive, but um, are there any convergence issues with this? Uh, it's uh, a, are, a good question. Conversely, are there any data sets you've encountered which have pathological? <laughs> uh, there can be convergence issues. So. What RSTAN ARM will do, so for the most part, the types of models that you're fitting with the RSTAN ARM package are uh, pretty robust in, in the sense that they're, like, there's a lot more complicated stuff you could do writing your own models in the STAN language than just the models that have been like pre-written in RSTAN ARM. Uh, so these have fewer convergence issues. You will get lots of warnings if something goes wrong and recommendations of what to look at, but, uh, you don't get as much of that with RSTAN ARM, not nearly as much as you would with like running, writing your own STAN programs, partially because I mean, it's just easy to make mistakes when you're writing a STAN program and these are already written, but also just because like we're using lots of tricks and reparameterizations and all sorts of other stuff behind the scene in RSTAN ARM to try to make the models as amenable as possible to the sampling that Stan uses, but you'll get warnings about our hat diagnostics and these things called divergences. If you want to learn more you can about that, you could come to the summer class I'll probably do with Jared. Uh, but um, so there are fewer convergence problems with these models than with like general Stan models, but they still exist and it can have to do with your data set uh, in particular. Um, and which priors you're using. If you use it, like we, we offer a prior called like the horseshoe prior and hierarchical shrinkage priors. And some of these are trickier to sample from. And so you might get warnings and there's a lot of stuff that we have written. So I recommend, uh, for example, so again, all of these are linked. So for example, the Bayes plot package website that you can go to from here has a vignette all about like if you get those convergence warnings. Uh, sorry. So this is where it'll take you if you click on the link to Bayes plots, Bayes plot, and there's a visual MCMC diagnostics vignette. And that's basically like a good resource for if you get those warnings when running a model like this. You can go there. It'll tell you how to make pictures of them and understand what the different. Uh, diagnostics are telling you. And if, for example, maybe you need to fit a different, you know, rewrite your model or um, unfortunately with our Stan arm, if the tips and tricks don't get your model to converge, you can't just go in there and tweak some part of the Stan code underlying the model. You can tweak all sorts of settings that we've anticipated, right? And allow you, you can change things about the MCMC sampler and all that stuff, but you can't change the actual Stan code in the R Stan arm program. But the BRMS package, which I didn't show, but is another package that um, was developed mostly by Paul Berkner, uh, who's now part of the STAN team, that will actually write a STAN program for you on the fly and could just give you a program for you to edit. 
yourself if you wanted to make some, like let's say you ask a question on the STAN users list and they say, oh, you should change your model like this to avoid convergence problems, uh, then uh, if you actually needed to edit the STAN code, you couldn't do that in our STAN arm, but you could for BRMS. Yeah, no, yeah, that's a good point. I guess what I meant more was like maybe the model that you're fitting, maybe we say, oh, you should fit a slightly different model, but our stand arm doesn't have that model. Then you couldn't just slightly tweak the code in our stand arm to give you that model. Well, you could in the source code, but then you'd have to like rebuild the package and all that stuff, or maybe submit a pull request to us or something like that. But, um, but yeah, so, uh, so you can't change the underlying code of the our stand arm models, but you shouldn't have, if you know you're fitting the model you want to be fitting and it's not converging and you're using our stand arm, there's probably not like a better way to write the same model in stand. Um, but there might be other ways to write similar models that are more likely to converge or something like that. Yeah. So I mean, one way that often happens is that you have to use like the non transition transformation. Yeah. And that used to be helpful a lot. That our arm will do for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Automatically, actually. Yeah. No, it's, it's just using, it's by default using the non-centered parameterization. <laughs> we can get into that. Is there a use for the parameterization? Not currently in our stand arm. Um, but that's mostly, for those of you who don't know, we're just, there's different ways to write the same statistical model. Some of them are more easily sampled from using MCMC than others. Uh, and we chose a certain way to tend to write the models in our stand arm that tends to work most often. And seems to work pretty well even when some other parameterizations are better and the other way is not true. The converse is not true. But um, yeah, so we don't give you too much control over the parameterizations, but we try to write the ones that work best in the majority of situations. Um, of course, if you write your own stand programs, you can use whatever parameterization you want. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. Um, but. Uh, Oh, my last thing I'll say is that if you want to use any of this stuff and you have questions, we really do like answering questions. This is the Stan uh, forums. Uh, please ask questions about any of this stuff. No question is to, uh, you know, if you're a beginner, that's fine. It's not just for like super advanced technical questions. We like questions from beginners too. Um, and then check out like all the websites, like each one of these, all the documentation is online, all the vignettes are online. We have like 10 vignettes for our Sten arm that just talk about all the different kinds of models you can fit and workflow. Um, and let us know if you use it and have questions or if you want to contribute to the Sten ecosystem in R, uh, now is a good time for that. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a, several day intensive stand course this summer through uh, Jared. If you're interested, uh, email me or message me and we'll start a list. Um, which will cover writing your own stand programs, but also all of these tools for like visualization and model comparison and all that other stuff. Um, and then uh, I'll stick around for a bit afterwards if you want to talk more after. Thanks.